Our interest in the history of Bramall Lane started when we found out it was the 90th anniversary of the first live radio commentary broadcast. This sparked an interest in finding out what other firsts happened at Bramall Lane and we were surprised of how many they were. We were unable to get a copy of the radio commentary but this is our interpretation on it. Today is the 22nd of January 1927. We are here at Highbury for the first ever live broadcast of a football match. Unbelievable scenes. As the game begins, pick up a square sheet so you'll know where the ball will be on the pitch. The game begins in the centre of squares 3, 4, 5 and 6. The game kicks off. A chance to cross for the young winger. What a save! It fumbles back to square 7. And the young midfielder, Tommy Boyle, strikes it. It rockets into the top corner. And Sheffield United lead 1-0. Commentators used squares to create a picture in your listeners' heads. It also showed where the ball was on the pitch at certain times. October 1878 saw the first floodlit game in football which happened at Bramall Lane in front of an attendance of 20,000. From 1893 the stadium was often used for football matches of the local Sheffield teams. On the 22nd of March 1889, six days after 22,688 people appeared to watch the FA Cup semi-final between Preston North End and West Bromwich Albion. It was decided to create a home football team to play at Bramall Lane. It was named Sheffield United after the cricket team. Sheffield United are famously known as the Blades, but where did this name come from? Well, before 1907, Sheffield United and Sheffield Wednesday were arguing over the name as Sheffield Wednesday thought that they were more entitled to it as they were the older club. However, in 1907, a cartoonist who was not from Sheffield depicted Sheffield United as the Blades and Sheffield Wednesday as an owl in one of his cartoons. Bramall Lane opened on the 30th of April 1855 as a cricket ground and was in its first seven years only used for cricket purposes. It was the first English sports club to use United in its name. Other Uniteds that followed were Manchester United 1878, Newcastle United 1892, West Ham United 1895, Scunthorpe United 1899, Carlisle United, 1904, Hartlepool United, 1908, Cambridge United, 1912, Leeds United, 1919, Rotherham United, 1925, Colchester United, 1937. The world's first football tournament, the Union Cup, held its final at Bramall Lane in March 1867 with Hallam beating Norfolk. This was followed by Cromwell Cup a year later, which was won by a newly formed team called the Wednesday. The first inter-association match between the FA, often referred to as the London FA and Sheffield FA, was held at Bramall Lane on the 2nd of December 1871. It was won 3-1 by the home side. By 1877, a crowd of 8,000 watched the Wednesday beat Hallam in the Sheffield Challenge Cup. England's match against Scotland on the 10th of March 1883 was the first match between these two countries outside London or Glasgow. It makes Bramall Lane the oldest football venue still capable of hosting international matches in the world. Bramall Lane was the first club to introduce football rules as we understand them today. Indirect free kick. For example, here you can see a player taking an indirect free kick from a handball and the referee counting the ball back 10 yards. <laughs> Here you can see a player taking a corner kick and having a designated goalkeeper in goal. After learning about the history of Bramall Lane, we then wanted to explore what it was like to be a professional football player in the 1970s and 80s. William Henry Folks, or to give him his proper name if you're a Sheffield United fan, Fatty Folks, is arguably one of the greatest players to play for Sheffield United and one of the greatest goalkeepers this country has ever seen. He was Sheffield United's goalkeeper from 1894 to 1905. Uh, he is the biggest, 
heaviest goalkeeper ever to play football in this country. Uh, so when he first signed for us, he was about 12 stones in weight and six foot two, which was very, very tall for a player then. Uh, but by the time he finished, he was about 24 stones in weight. So he was a big lad. Interesting thing about Folks was he was very much the man about town. Okay, And he would have lived a very, very good life for a football player. These days, Premier League football players are on colossal amounts of money. But even back then, the style of life he would have had from his wages would have been a good one. Uh, Folks were on about £5 a week from Sheffield United then. Plus he'd get appearance money, plus he'd get a bonus if he played for England. And if you were a working man in Sheffield working in a steelworks or a cutlery firm or something like that, you've had to work a lot of hours to get anywhere near that sort of wage. So by the time he finished and by the time he died, he would have been huge. I know for a fact that when he died, he died in a nursing home, which was on Glossop Road, near where the Hallamshire Hospital is today. And when he died, they had to take the door off to get his body out. So he was well over 24 stones in weight when he died. He was a huge man. And in those days, I doubt very much there would have been a motor-driven hearse or anything of that nature. It would have been drawn by uh, horses with big plumes on the head. The undertakers that looked after the funeral arrangements are still in Sheffield today, and they're at Spittle Hill near the cemetery. They're called uh, John Heath and Sons, really famous undertakers. Um, and they would have had to draw him all the way up that track to the end, and then just imagine how many people it would have taken to pick that coffin up and carry it to that last resting place. What always surprises me when you be in the cemetery, the grave doesn't look a big one, does it? Yet underneath that grass, underneath that gravestone, is probably one of the greatest football players this country's ever produced and one of the most successful as well. So I think it would have been quite a job and there were thousands of people at his funeral. My name is Len Badger. I played for Sheffield United for 17 years, man and boy, uh, and spent three years at Chesterfield in the latter part of my career. If anybody can experience that, it's your childhood dream, well, my childhood dream, and obviously I lived that dream, and it's a fantastic experience. Players were definitely uh, a lot more loyal because they, they were more local lads playing in the local teams. Whereas now, you have a look at, especially the Premiership, there's 75% foreign players, which in my day, majority of the players, the 75% were local, local boys. Right, being the youngest captain of Sheffield United at 18 year old, obviously was a great honour and captain a team that included Joe Shaw, Graham Shaw, legends of Bremer Lane who, who I idolised. Uh, so it, it was an honour that I today revere. So uh, to recognise that I had to become a leader of men at 18 is a big, a big responsibility, which I obviously took really seriously. If you're going to ask me the three greatest players who I, who I played with at Bramall Lane, I'll do them in uh, the order and but this will upset somebody. If I put Joe Shaw as the third best player that I played with and then Tony Curry as the second and the best player I thought at Bramall Lane, no longer with us, started at the same time as me. We had an instant understanding of what we, we needed to do as players. And the player is Alan Woodward, who was absolutely underrated by everybody. Uh, what a great player. Could score from 30 yards, could take the ball up to the goalkeeper, go past him. Best striker of a ball I have ever seen. Great player. Tony Curry. Curry! Oh, he's got it! Tremendous header from Tony Curry. In our day, in the 60s, 70s, and up until recent times, until they changed the rule, the goalkeepers weren't allowed to move in our day, so it was a lot easier to score a penalty. So if you miss one, you felt really bad. Nowadays, the goalkeepers can move, mess about, wave their hands, and it's, it's a bit off-putting. 
So uh, it's a lot harder to, to, miss a, to, to score a penalty now. Have I got any regrets? Lots of regrets. Lots of regrets. Um, you know, contractual, um, when I sign contracts, you know, just sign for the, for the love of the game and not for my future, really. And, and a lot of players, most players in my day were the same. There was players in my day that didn't sign contra uh, didn't have anything. They'd sign blank contracts. I signed a blank contract when I went to QPR. And I know somebody else who uh, signed a few blank contracts. <laughs> when I first started, I think there was about four four players had cars, so you had to come in to work on the bus like everybody else did. So you can't imagine that's the case today, can you? Although, uh, when the, the maximum, wa uh, maximum wage was uh, abolished, so people negotiated a little bit more money, graduated into cars, and, uh, but you were still very close to the supporters. Uh, but now, but it isn't the player's fault. If somebody's going to give you £300,000 a week, you're not going to say no, are you? But it does tend to take you away from ordinary people because you live behind walled, walled places. Uh, but we lived where ordinary people lived. So I think the highlight of my career uh, was we, we got promotion in 70, 71, and we went into the big league. And the ground was actually a football cricket ground at the time. And Worcester were playing Yorkshire at Bramall Inn. Ted Emsley, a colleague of mine, played left back for us. He was playing for Worcester. And the, the fixture list came out for the next season. And I went into the dressing room while Ted was waiting to go out to bat. And we looked at the first 10 games uh, and we said, if we get three points out of that, we'll be highly delighted. And what we did do, we won eight, drew one, and lost one. And to do that, to go into the big league and be top of the league, uh, and it is the last time that Sheffield United have been top, which is now the Premiership. That's the last time we were in 1972. I just love football. Ever since I can remember, I've been, I was kicking oranges or socks or balls around the front room, trying to get my boy to do it now. He, he, he doesn't seem more bored about dinosaurs. But um, yeah, that, that's all I can remember doing. It was like kids could play on game consoles now or, or play with Lego and that. All I can ever remember doing is, is playing football or, or, or some form of sport. My football career started at a side called Woodhouse Angels. Uh, it was a Sunday league type team. I went with my brother for a training session. I was uh, 18 months younger than my brother, which obviously he was playing for the under 11s, which uh, at that time I were only nine. So I only just scraped through by uh, telling a few pork pies. I was 12 years old when I joined Sheffield United Academy. Prior to that, I'd played at Mansfield and Derby County. Um, and when I was playing for Chesterfield Boys, a player who played in the first team here called Kevin Hurst, his father was one of the scouts at the club at the time. He saw me playing and brought me along and I've been at the club ever since. I made my debut on loan at Barnsley. Uh, I was 17. David Hurst had just gone to Sheffield Wednesday. So I, they, was, I was, they hadn't got a strike for the start of the season, so I went the opposite way. Uh, I made my debut against Crystal Palace and I scored after 38 seconds. My debut under 17s when I started full time football was against Bristol City and I got sent off for two yellows as captain. So I don't think I was captain again. <laughs> <laughs> But um, it was brilliant. We stayed over uh, in a hotel. First time I'd done that in terms of a league fixture. We'd been on tours before to Italy and, and all that when we were growing up. But that, we stayed over. We did everything that the first team would do. 
Um, so and to lead your team out in a sort of professional environment, arguably for the first time, was was a great feeling. It just didn't last that long afterwards. Not many people uh, at Wednesday knew I was obviously Sheffield United fan. When I left, I went to Man City. Obviously, then it come out that Sheffield United was interested in me. And then, like, like I put in the papers, it was a childhood dream to play for the club I supported as a child. The, the transition from player to coach to, to head of academy, has, it's all happened quite quickly, really. So I'm 30 years old uh, and I stopped playing at 21. So when I've enjoyed it all along the way, so it hasn't felt like it, it's been a long time. Um, regarding... The, I've got great pride in this football club, so I, I wasn't brought up a Sheffield United fan, but I've been here since I was 12 years old, and I class this as my, as my club now. So in terms of once you get your head around that and you love football, for me it was a seamless transition that I, I said to myself, by the age of 30 I want to be involved in a first team coaching staff or be a caddy manager or under 23s coach. So I've achieved that in the time I wanted to. And I just want us to produce the best players we can. After exploring what it was like to be a footballer in the 70s and 80s, we then felt compelled to look into how much football has changed from players to the fans on the terraces. Uh, I've been a fan for, um, of Sheffield United for around 20 years now. Uh, my dad brought me to my first game when I was just close to five years old, a game versus Watford. And I think Sheffield United won one 0 if I remember rightly. I've been a fan ever since I was born. Dad was a fan, everything like that. Living around this area, I had to be a Sheffield United fan. Always. From primary school to secondary school. It's interesting. Uh, it was a bit of a whirlwind. I remember when I first started about seven years ago now. Uh, I was 17 at the time and it was pretty, pretty much full on. Uh, I'd never experienced anything like it. I never sort of dreamed that I'd be able to see the inner sides of a football club that I support. It's all, all used to it now. It's pretty much normal for me, but at the time when it was all new, it was very exciting. I like how it is because it's a nice modern football ground, yeah. Uh, it's not, I'm one old fashioned, I still prefer to stand up on the top. Uh, but each to their own on that one. I get the buzz coming in, seeing the stadium on a non-match day where normal people wouldn't see it, even being in the museum where we are now, uh, knowing some of the people that I know, some of my heroes growing up. I mean, I remember when Billy Sharp first came through, who's now the club captain, he was the came through academy about 19, 20 years old. I remember being in the stands watching him play. And now to sort of have the personal relationship with him that I've got is quite exciting and quite unique, I think, in a way, for, some, for a lot of the fans that are here on a day-to-day -day basis. The highlight of working for this football club is definitely the people. There's a lot of good people working here, even at the ground, at the training facility as well. And feeling a part of the club that you support or you have supported growing up is really good and it makes your friends really jealous as well. My dad has followed Sheffield United from a young age, collecting football programmes from the games and memories he treasures the most. He found two old football programmes in the attic for us to look at, specifically programmes including a long-time favourite, Tony Curry. I sat down with Tony to explore past memories of his career. 14 September 1974, well I was 24 years old, getting on for 25. Ken Furphy was the manager. Ken Furphy was my manager at Watford, he gave me my first job, which was nice, and then he sold me to Sheffield United and then he became Sheffield United manager. And that season, 74, that would be 74, 75, we actually nearly won the league that year. If we'd have beaten Derby, who won the league, if we'd have beaten them home and away, we would have won the league. And for a little club like Sheffield United, get that bit of Yorkshire then, they what? And, um, you know, that would have been a, a fantastic achievement. But yeah, yeah, Tony Field played in this game. Oh dear, never mind. Of course we've got another one here as well. And this is West Ham, 22nd of March, 1975. 
Is that the is that the quality goal by a quality player game? I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, it won't won't be in there because that'd have been sold on the day before the game started. Ah, of course. Of course. Um. And even though we won that game, that was the year, March '75. No, no, that was the same year as we. We became uh, we we finished six in the league, four points from winning it. But yeah, we won that game three two after being two nil down or two one down. Yeah, three two. It says it on the back. Brilliant. Great game. Great memories. <laughs> 